Okay, there we go. All right, it's my privilege to introduce William Villalongo. William lives and works in Brooklyn, New York. He was born in 1975 in Hollywood, Florida and raised in the town of Bridgeton, New Jersey. He received his BFA from the Cooper Union for the Advancement of Science and Art and his MFA from Tyler School of Art at Temple University. He attended Skohegan School of Painting and Sculpture Resi Residency as well. Villalongo's creative output involves studio practice, writing, and curatorial projects. His figurative paintings, works on paper, and sculpture are concerned with representing the Black subject against notions of race and explore metaphors for mythology, wayfinding, and liberation. Critically acclaimed curatorial projects such as American Beauty at Susan Inglet Gallery in 2013 and Black Pulp, touring nationally between 2016 and 2018, explore the intersections of politics, history, and art. Villalongo is a recipient of the prestigious Louis Comfort Tiffany Award, the Joan Mitchell Foundation Painters and Sculptors Grant, and the 2022 Jules Guerin and Harold M. English Rome Prize Fellow in Visual Art. His work is included in several notable co collections, including the Studio Museum in Harlem, the Whitney Museum of American Art, Princeton University Art Museum, El Museo del Barrio, and Denver Art Museum. His work has been reviewed in Art in America, The New Yorker, and The New York Times. William is represented by Susan Inglet Gallery in New York and is a, the Associate Professor at Cooper at the Cooper Union School of Art. Welcome, William. Thank you, Lori, and thank you, everybody at PAFA, for the opportunity to talk with you all today. Um, I am going to jump in. So the talk here, um, the Black presence, uh, where the where where uh, where the Black Atlantic meets the Black Mediterranean, um, is really a talk I'm going to give about my research in Rome as the uh, as a Rome Prize recipient in 2021. Um, I had the the privilege and pleasure to be there, uh, um, like Rodin uh, did in the 50s. And um, because I was able to be located geographically in the Mediterranean um, and looking, uh, more or less looking for signs of the Black president presence um, in relationship to antiquity, I had this great opportunity uh, geographically to to visit um, other parts of Europe. So what you're going to see um, coming up is um, uh, me getting around um, to uh, southern Italy, Sicily, uh, Florence, and parts of Tuscany, um, um, Puglia, um, Paris, uh, Egypt, um, and I and I think I said Sicily, but um, it, it was a, I, I, I wish I could have done more, honestly, that you're going to see a lot, but I wish I could have done more, honestly, but we were in COVID and, and um, in the middle of COVID at the time. So uh, travel to certain sites was really impossible, but I got a lot done. Um, so I'm just going to start off with just a reel of images because there's so much stuff that I really didn't know how to do this in an hour. So I'm going to, I'm going to try and Lori will yell at me if I'm, if I, if I'm, going over too too far. So we'll just jump right in and then um, I'll, I'll give something a little bit more structure to this after. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay. So. We don't yet see your screen. Oh, okay. Sorry, you guys. I'm having some technical issues here. My cursor. Okay. Sorry. That's it. Okay. Sorry. Um, working between a screen and a laptop, so it's a little funky. Okay, here we go.
Okay, so this is the American Academy in Rome um, sort of aerial shot. It is a massive uh, complex that I would say is maybe one city block long by two city blocks deep. So there's a, a large uh, um, um, uh, backyard, uh, there's a courtyard in the main building. Um, I'm not sure I can show you my, my cursor, um, but I sort of circled uh, where my studio um, is in relationship to the entire place. So you see that there's sort of trees popping out of the middle of that, um, the, the building on the um, left side of your screen. That's a Cortile um, courtyard and um, more or less those, that McKimbian White building, it's called McKimbian White or the architects, um, built this place um, and we live there. Um, um, a lot of the spaces in this are, are, are um, dorm rooms or um, living quarters and studio spaces. Uh, there's a grand salone and a kitchen and, you know, we eat together, um, uh, meals together almost every day. Um, just to give you a, a, a kind of really short synopsis of, of what that is. Um, and the place was really built for kind of the, the study of Italian antiquities, antiquities really. Um, there are, there's a photo archive, there are, there are archaeological archives, um, and the building, uh, uh, right next to it, um, families live there. It's also sort of rented out as a, 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 a sort of art school, um, to another organization. So this is my studio and I'm kind of, I'm kind of convinced that John Roden was in my studio, uh, or I was in John Roden's same studio after looking at photos in the exhibition. Um, I was really inspired by looking at the, to, with this talk, looking at the exhibition and looking at John Roden's amazing, the amazing photographs through the, out the exhibition of him and his wife sort of traveling the world and, and, and seeing, um, see, seeing um, it from that point of view um, and being inspired. Um, I did, I was moved to make sculpture when I was there. So I'm pretty convinced, I'm very convinced it was, it was, I was in that studio. <laughs> um, if you turn the camera around, this is what you would see from the previous slide, um, the interior. And I don't mean to do this as a flex. It was a really amazing space. Um, and this is before I ate too much pasta. So um, I came there with this idea of of um, looking for the Black Atlantis. The Black Atlantis myth is a, a super, uh, you know, comes, I guess, in the 50s and 60s, uh, this idea, I mean, it's much older at Atlantis, but the Black Atlantis idea is sort of cemented itself in, in Black popular culture for a while now. And I wanted to um, trace that because um, when you go to Rome, and I've been there when I was a student, you go to the Piazza Navona where this uh, is, you see the Fontana del Moro, which is right here. Um, and uh, the central figure of the, the, um, the fountain is um, this uh, Black Neptune or Moro Neptune figure um, um, put there by Bernini. Um, all of these, the, 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 uh, the, the fountain itself had been there for a while. So Bernini really kind of came in and made this central figure. Um, and, um, I'll keep going. So I, I was curious about that. Why is there this perfect image of a black Atlantis in the middle of Rome? And how could I use that as a premise to, to go on a kind of a research thing, uh, or a research sort of uh idea um these are kind of the the kind of world i kind of grew up with their knowledge about black atlantis um you got sun ra drexio is a kind of um group in the um i guess you would call it like ambient or or house deep deep house um of course it's still um prevalent um in black culture uh a kind of thinking and harkening back to ancient civilization, ancient civil, black civilizations. Um, 
And of course, there's, you know, there there are the these books out there um, that really are uh, cementing the idea of Atlantis as a as a sort of a, a black uh, space. Um, and you can think of this as scholarship or conspiracy theory or whatever. I don't have a. I think it's all very interesting, and in that there must be some reason for it all um, to be uh, so relevant and so important for so long. Um, I did some research and I, and, and looking at this figure that Bernini, this Moro, it, it, it is, it is sort of interesting. It didn't lead me to where I thought I might go with this fountain, but it was interesting that, um, Bernini's, um, uh, sculptures for that fountain have been rejected over and over and over by the, by the Pope at the time, um, whose family, the papal home was is right behind the the fountain. If you go back here, that that building you see in the background um, uh, to the excuse me, I believe to the to the right side, it's just a little bit of it was the papal home, um, and so it's it's sort of maybe it's lore, maybe it's truth, but it said that Bernini sort of made this as a kind of snub or, or a gesture to to the to the papacy, um, and that. It mimics this um, this sculpture found around the corner from it um, um, of Pasquino. Pasquino um, is the statue of Pasquino is an ancient poet and is now one of many. Um, I guess they would call them talking statues throughout the city of Rome. These are places where the public can come and sort of put their protests to to the to either the the whoever's in charge, the power, the power structure, the powers that be, the government um, now. Um, but and 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 the in those times it would have been the papacy and the church. Um, so there are statues like this all around. So you can see Bernini, Bernini um using the same kind of gesture, the strug and the kind of contraposto of the of the of the um neck or the head sort of uh gesture over the shoulder. Um I looked into the mythology too, and it's really it is really interesting in that um, I'm not going to go through this whole thing, but I, I did I did I did do my research, and it is interesting how interconnected the uh, mythologies around Neptune, uh, Neptune and Triton um, are come back to um, are, are intertwined with the story of Atlantis, Neptune being um, the um, sort of the the ruler um of, of atlantis uh and um and we see that say like triton for example offspring are born in 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 places like like tripoli these areas um and uh, there are these struggles between the athens and athens and north africa even in, within the context of the mythology so all that is interesting in that Geographically, this is where I found sort of everything the uh, this this longer story uh, trajectory of a story that is about these sort of long power struggles and trade and um, and exchanges between North Africa and the Medi and the larger Mediterranean. This is a a, a really really cool thing um, in Venice at the Museo of Coror. Sorry for my. Um, uh, my typo there. Um, this is this map by far uh, Moreau is a, is it's really a world map. So this is the entire world, known world to um, at the time, um, and it's oriented south. Look, uh, uh, so it's oriented the opposite way that we usually see it. So you see there that the African continent is actually the big landmass that's at the top, um, sort of top right. And you see just below it um, the Italian Peninsula and the Mediterranean, and then off to the to the left, you're going into to to Asia. Um, but all of these all these little land masses are everywhere. So this is a really a really cool thing, and I think it's a really interesting um, way to enter this kind of world, this kind of ancient world in which in which the way that we think about Europe and the way that we think about the Mediterranean as centered around um, um, Europeanness and whiteness, 
um, all comes into question when you think about the ancient, when you really look into the ancient world and um, and go beyond the kind of, I would say the the, the kind of um, education we get as young people in school um, about um, um, that trajectory of time. Um, this is really important. This, this painting, this mural, I guess you, it's, 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 a, it's a huge, you know, like fresco mural at the Capitol Line Museum of Hannibal, um, uh, you know, uh, during the second Punic War. So this is, these, these, uh, um, uh, empires, the Carthaginian and the Numidian, uh, empires were, you know, dating back or some to 650 BC. So this is like a world before, this is a world before the Roman empire. Um, and it's a world in which, um, trade and trade, uh, this is before like the Hellenistic period that we think about those beautiful Greek pots and things like that. This is sort of a little, uh, we're, we're talking, um, before all of that, um, in a world in which these North African rulers are, have a lot of power influence around the, the Italian peninsula that we know today. And that traces through everything, through, through everything that we associate and think about as, as, uh, as, as Greek and Roman um, today. This is a, I'm gonna throw some of my work in there, uh, here and there. Um, so that um, we can put this sort of in context. Um, this is a Tondo paint, painting that I've made um, called Black Menagerie. Um, and this is moon, Black Menagerie Moon Mask. Um, and in these paintings, while I was in Rome, I started pulling together a lot of this information, a lot of these images that I was sort of finding connected to a Black present presence and the interesting thing about all that was that I wasn't necessarily always finding um you know representations of people it was really becoming in this kind of story of trade and things like ceramics and and, and objects and material culture and technologies where you really find um, the black presence in antiquity um, I'm trying to do I'm trying to pull those things together into into a kind of um I don't know. You could. It's 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 a it's both a ma micro and macro. It could be a petri dish. It could be a constellation. So pottery. Whew, there's a long story, um, and a lot to push through here. So you're looking at the Testaccio neighborhood uh, in Rome on the left hand side. This is, you're on top of the Testaccio. Um, hill looking out um, uh, out into the city of Rome. This neighborhood is kind of like, I don't know, I guess it's kind of like Bushwick. And if you're in New York, it's like, um, it's a it's an old neighborhood that seen better days, but is being populated with really cool young people and hip restaurants and, and, uh, and it's a fun place to visit. Um, the 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 it was built on this kind of mound of pottery shards believe it or not the entire the the neighborhood is is was a landfill during the roman empire um so what you're seeing on the right hand side is on the is literally on the ground like that is what you see is these shards of pottery everywhere this whole thing so if you can imagine in this neighborhood there are restaurants that have that are like excavating into the hill and and building out their restaurant some places show or have put up sort of uh these you know thick glass to show you the excavation um and all the pottery the layer the layers um that are there so at this at this time this is um this is victor martinez he's an archaeologist who was at the academy and his wife was also a a, a fellow he was there um able to, looking at a site that that um, that he was sort of processing, other, in other words, getting a bunch of pottery and looking at what's good and what's bad. So uh, Shrada and I would watch Victor like every evening in the basement of, of Villa Chiara, Chiara, Chiara 
sort of sifting through these shards of pot, seeing what's 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 what. Um, but what we found, what what this story really is, is that for a long time in the Roman Empire, pots of these large amphora would come in from from Spain of olive oil, um, and that technology eventually went uh, away and was um, and this other pottery came into four, which is African slip clay. It was lighter, lighter, thinner, easy to transport. And so what you have in this site is just a mound of all of that stuff. So pottery was very, you know, kind of throwaway. You would use, you, you would use something or use a dish and you, you'd throw it out. Um, so Italian black glaze and janiform. This is interesting, Villa Giulia, Giulia, excuse me, in Rome, which is an, a museum sort of dedicated to Etruscan um, art and culture. Um, and you know, we when we look at these, we often think about like the beautiful Greek vases. Well, these things are predating that um, in some cases, um, and the black glaze technique is actually like something that we really associate with, with these beautiful Greek pots that you see in the Met and things, but the actual technology of that really was being developed in North Africa um, um, during the Carthaginian and Numidian empires. And those, th th that there was an ex extreme amount of trade between Greek and North Africa and parts of, and, and parts of Southern Italy. Um, and so this, this, what's interesting, I, I think about the, the Etruscan is that uh, what you're seeing on the, the right hand side of this janiform pot is how important it seemed to, to be for them to, to represent this black presence. And they would call them Ethiopians, I would say they would, they refer to, to uh, black people at that time. Um, and we don't, I don't know much, we don't know much about what that relationship was. We do know that the Etruscans helped Hannibal um, in his push against the Roman, the burgeoning Roman Empire. Um, we do know that there was a lot of trade. Um, and this, you know, and, and, and it's, it's, if you think about geography, again, just to think that the Carthaginian Empire, they were, they were, working, right, the Etruscans are in north, northern Italy, they're controlling most of South Italy and Sardinia and Sicily and trading with Greece. So you can see the Roman Empire is really burgeoning out of this city state at the center of, of what, we, what we now call Italy. Um, you can also see down in the, the left hand side, a figure that the glaze is, is worked its way off. Um, and I found this interesting because, you know, uh, uh, an architect, um, Jermaine Barnes, actually turned turned me on to this particular technique because I was in Rome, sort of basically covering things with black material. And he's like, "Hey, hey, did you see this? They, that you know, people were doing this in North Africa, and like in you know, six hundred BC." These are um, some of the texts that were important. Um, I started with the Snowden text, Black and Antiquities, and that kind of, which that pot that we just saw in Villa, uh, Villa Giulio is, is primarily featured on the cover. But these are, there are some other texts that I found um, in my research. The most recent here is the Sarah uh, Derbru book, uh, Untangling Blackness in Greek Antiquity, um, and probably maybe the most, uh, uh, I guess, recent and um, text on thinking about those things. But this other book, The Hellenist of West, really outlines the, the um, uh, and upends um, the, the, the relationship of how we understand uh, Greek antiquity as well and Greek pots and the technologies that went into those um, things. This is um, some of that. This is a sort of a fancier version of the African slipware and uh, and uh, the Eretine would uh, Eretine or, or Etruscan um, uh, northern northern Italian pre which predates the African slipware um, is is there were there were nicer versions in which there were like these kind of images and stuff and this these two types of um, clay get really um, confused with 
in antiquity and there's a, a, whole, a whole hubbub about like, you know, what's what. Um, but really the Ertine ware comes first and as the Roman, as the as North Africa becomes the center of, um, it slowly becomes the center of production for pottery and is finding, um, finding um, I guess, quicker ways to, and more efficient ways of making these things. Call it like the Amazon or something. I don't know, or like, you know, Ikea uh, for, uh, for, for ancient times. But um, so there's a lot of this stuff. And this is some of the stuff that you might, not this stuff, this is really fancy, but it's some of the stuff that you might find in Testaccio Hill, um, this African slipwear. Um, I, I, I came across uh, in my research on the Arantine Potter, potters that that you know this is okay so this is early roman empire um and this um and the the people making these are are, are enslaved people um and um they are signing the the finest pots right this, so this is industrial this is industrial slavery in 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 the roman empire and this is handicraft slavery um but the really talented people are signing their or pots with stamps and um and you're often told that there's not really correlations between the roman empire uh, the the industrial complex of the roman empire and and the ones in the americas but um i actually found that not to be true and uh and i had some people sasha may eccleson if you're if you're watching help me really sift through those um the way that those mythologies have been sort of uh, forced through us through our education and so on the, of course, on the, the left, you have the um, David Drake pottery, um, industrial slavery, handicraft slavery in the uh, American South, signing pots, uh, signing pots and the value um, and, and really having everyone rethink what the value of them, these things are because of the craftsmanship and the signature. Um, this is a piece I made sort of thinking about this called um, uh, Dance with Dave. Or dance for Dave, um, and I'm so as I'm doing the research, I'm pulling together, you know, these um, bits and pieces of where you find the black presence and connections that I'm sort of making, um, and I'm pulling them into a type of body um, that's being formed by them and informed by them appearing and disappearing, um, and. Um, you know, I could go on and on, um, but the there there's uh, in this time, and we're still talking about um, <clears throat> these, this this moment, the Hellenistic period, pre-Hellenistic period. You have uh, Opus Africanum, which is a type of um, a type of building. So you see in the uh, in that slide on the left that you have these sort of post, you have these um, big posts. And, and slabs that are vertical and horizontals, and they're being filled in um, between with a lot of different stone. That's um, the Opus Africanum style, and you find it all over antiquity in, in Sicily and um, in Campania, um, everywhere that there um, that that influence that North African influence find. Opus Septile is a type of um, um, a type of tile making. It's also developed in North in, in North Africa, um, and it's interesting stuff because it's like inlay. It's like your it's a it's a mix of of marble tiles and little stones sort of pushed together, and to, so it's a kind of an eclectic mix of a of of um, of material coming together to form these really beautiful um, things. So both both of these. Um, are developing uh, pre pre Roman Empire in in North Africa. Um, pop down to Sicily and um, and what's interesting about these tiles? This is in a Sicily. I, uh, I'll sh tell. I'll share more about my trip as we go through. There's no sort of uh, there's this whole thing is not is not linear at all. Um, so. These 
this this archaeological site in in Ina Sicily was is, is uh, uh, Villa Romana Casale. So it it is uh, not known who owned this place or why they built it, but um, it is um, maybe said that whoever was there, maybe a senator, a senator, or someone that was an intermediary um, for during the Roman Empire an intermediary, intermediary between the African continent uh, and the and and the um, city state in Rome. And um, what you find are these incredible, incredible, my photographs do not do it justice, sorry, um, uh, tile works of these exotic animals being traded and put on boats and moved across seas. Um, and you see in the tessellation um, that there are really painstaking ways to go through and talk and, and show, you know, differences of uh, um, dif different ethnic features and, and skin colors. So um, however we want to, however we think or want to talk or whatever the controversies are about around um, identifying race at the time, it is, pretty clear in everything that I've seen that it was uh, that type of representation representation was important. The diversity of the of what antiquity was for people was Im important. And um, even though it's often flattened in, um, in how we um, uh, are informed by it. Um, so these, yeah, so, uh, you know, some people say that uh, that this person might have been an intermediary moving like animals large animals um, or at least documenting or in the in the decorative um, expensive decorative uh, I don't know what you would call it like decadence of it all um, talking about how exotic animals are coming into the Roman Empire maybe finding themselves in places like the Colosseum you know lions um, you know fighting uh, warriors in the Colosseum or something like that um, more tile. Um, on the left, you go to the Vatican and you see these beautiful black and white floors also talking about um, the sea, the ocean, the exotic animals. Um, and, um, and of course, that center figure is a, is a Neptune figure or a Triton figure. Um, you come over here. Now we're in the 19, late 1920s and 30s in fascist architecture at Fora Italico. Uh, where Mussolini has built this in, uh, large um, stadium complex, um, which was the, uh, for the 1940s Olympics. Um, and on the, the, the really defunct, um, cracking, broken, rotting floors of this place, you see that there are, is a hearkening back to this kind of beautiful type of uh, flooring what is being put pushed into the narrative is this the relationship of um of the conquering of of north africa so the lion of judah comes up in the the foot of the uh the the you know the foot on the head of the lion all of these things are sort of nods to um uh, to um control over ethiopia and um and eritrea um, and, um, I wish I could show you more of this stuff, but you know, all, all over the floor is like Duce, Duce, Duce. It's like a kind of big, um, sort of, um, celebration to Mussolini. Um, and then in the, um, the National Gallery, um, there at Rome, they, you know, you can see this massive, massive painting of these, um, wars being fought, um, between, um, between Italy and, uh, and, and North Africa, Eritrea and Ethiopian warriors. This happens a few times in, in history. Um, Italy never quite is able to completely control, um, control, um, everything. Uh, and, but contemporary Italians wonder why, um, you know, there's this kind of wondering why people are migrating to Italy in particular in this space in particular. Well, the answer is they've been migrating and and to that space probably since 800 BC or something. My, uh, you know, 
people in North Africa been migrating in and out of the Italian peninsula and the Mediterranean uh, with various levels of control and influence at any time. So why, why would today be any different? Exotic Shells and Rarities this is a painting I made in, um, in two, 2021. I was still like with Aquarium and um, um, it's, it's a, it's a, uh, the background is a velvety coating, um, flocking. Um, these things are sort of hard to, to get in, in photographs. Um, and the rest of the pieces is actually painted um, um, acrylic. Um, and I was, came across uh, um, this text by Claudia Swan and had the pleasure to meet Claudia uh, in person recently. Uh, and she outlines this relationship of exotic shells and procuring exotic shells and and turning them in, you know, uh, pearl, pearling them or, or doing these, these uh, chemical things to them to uh, make them even kind of more beautiful and shine them up. And, um, but all those things were being procured by um, um, African um, slaves, um, uh at, at the time um so you know now we're bumping over somewhere into the um you know um 18th century or, or um 17th 16th and 17th century um and this that's our book but then you see over here there's an illustration in the book and, and you see the black figures in the front there i don't know if you noticed that there are two black figures on the ground in the front um with you know all kinds of sea animals uh, and things like that. And this is something you'll see over and over and over again in painting. Most of you might know this, that um, that Black people are always, you know, often represented as the as slaves are always kind of low and down on the ground with animals. It's kind of a trope that finds it, that goes, that pre predates, you know, um, Dutch painting. It, it goes back pretty far. Um, so this is this is now we're in the Uffizi Museum in Florence, Italy, and this is uh, the Turbino, um, the Turbino of of the Uffizi. It's a huge room. What you're looking at that big photograph on the right. What you're looking at and those little dots is all abalone shell. This is all abalone shell. This is probably one of the most insane things I've seen. Um, I'm giving you kind of close-ups of that bottom um, with the royal blue. That's the abalone shell close-up that you're seeing just below the 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 domo. Um, that's the design, so you can see how intensely, um, you know, inlaid the abalone is. And then the top photograph on the left is just like the ground floor. It's a big, large dome. Uh, you can't walk in, but you can kind of put your, sneak your head across the red uh, line and kind of look up into this thing. It's, it's totally nuts. Um, went to Paris and it was, it was fortunate to that. Um, um, well, it was fortunate. It was our birthdays, but it was also that this exhibition was up that, which really speaks to a lot of what Claudia Swan is talking about, which is how these objects, how material culture finds itself in these objects, these, these kind of rare objects um, and and uh, and we see so so for me it's interesting because we see the black presence right in these things in a very different way um, so um, the the in the in the representation of exotic animals so that ostrich is is you know I is a sorry the ostrich is um, yes ivory um, excuse me ebony from Gabon the the um the little rhinoceros is 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 um ivory right um um the what they call a sugar slave is this um all all sort of silver it's this solid silver um and you see this sort of this figure carrying the the um pieces of sugar cane and and again I wish my photographs are better but this is all articulated in, in excruciating details, the little feathers on the dress and the knots and the sugar cane is all articulated amazingly. So this, this exhibition really looks at the, 
the 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 exchange and what you know what Europe is in relationship to the to the material cultures and these kind of um you know objects uh and materials um I'm still in this is also still in in the Louvre I, I believe these paintings and I'm in the Louvre um but this is the type of thing that um Claudia is talking about that I was looking at the time and it's nice to see these things in person I went on my own venture for some exotic stuff in uh, Porta Portese, um, which is a big flea market in the center of Rome. Um, as John Roden was telling me, I need to make a sculpture. So this um, uh, left side, they're just these shells. I got on the shells there and then got this gold chain. This is going somewhere. It's me and my studio with these materials. I'm often bringing in the, the, the drinking gourd as a kind of uh, uh, conversation about American folklore, the drinking gourd as the constellation of the Big Dipper, um, by which um, enslaved people found north during the un on the Underground Railroad. Um, so the gourds have come in. I found a gourd farm in in Rimini, uh, and um, I painted everything black, and I put velvet on everything, um, and I made and I made a sculpture. Um, this is that sculpture in various states of being in the studio. Um, it's called Beacon, uh, and, um, it has a, it has the, it has a sound component that I, I, um, worked with, um, uh, composer, um, Igor Santos, um, we talked about nocturnes and he made a kind of sound component um, that's in there. Um, I had it, I had the opportunity to show this in Florence at the Villa Romana in Florence, Italy, uh, where um, um, Joseph, uh, artist, educator, Joseph Randolph Thompson organizes something called Black History Month Florence. Um, and so Villa Romana, which is a kind of, American or like the equivalent of the American Academy for for uh, for Germans like it's a it's a basically a old beautiful um uh, uh, manor house estate that has residencies for like 10 German artists uh and um they go there and they make and they have their studios but it has this incredible glass pavilion that I was able to use to install beacon um, Beacon has, of course, the gourds thinking about the American South, and then this other object called a Testa de Moro, which you see in the middle, which I've manipulated, uh, and I'll talk about later. Testa de Moro, which is a Sicilian um, sort of craft um, uh, that represents, um, that has a representation of a, of a Black person or a Moor. So these are some details of it in that space. Um, um, there's a lot to say about Florence. That's Justin, the tall fellow standing um, at the back and center of the photograph. That's Justin Randolph Thompson. Uh, he's been in Florence for over 20 years. He went there, uh, found the love of his life, then come back, made some children, and is um, um, doing this incredible work um, called the Recovery Plan. Um, where he's uh, he's been able to open up reading a reading room and talk about black culture, talk about black culture in, in the context of Italy, um, helping younger artists, which you're seeing some of them uh, there and the 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 two the two uh, people on the right hand side of the photograph, young black Italian artists um, having residencies, um, and these are some of the cohort um, in that group. Uh, I don't have to point everything out. S.A. Smythe and, uh, and and you have Eric Mack, um, and you have Autumn Knight, um, and Fairly Baez, as as amongst others. But we went there a few times with different conferences and learned a lot. Um, Il Moro in Egypt. So, uh, William, we're at two minutes. We're at twelve forty nine. <laughs> okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. I think I'm going to, I think I'm almost there. So um, 
here we are at um in back in back in Rome and these are um this is um the the site of what might could be um the Museum of Ital African Italian that are the African Italian Museum um uh held in this eth ethnographic museum in um in Ur uh Rome um it's basically Mussolini's collection of 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 objects from that he either either took during the battles in in Eritrea Ethiopia and Libya or or in some cases um there was a handicraft there were, there were handicraft schools and particularly in Libya where some of these objects were made the the what you're seeing is the the objects in vitrine in storage it's kind of like a, a storage exhibition of the storage so it's very store has this storage storage core vibe to it and these like long plastic things with you know, kind of rhetorical questions or weird questions like, what should we do with our history of colonialism? How we, so that people are sort of torn about these objects and what to do with them. And it's a big conversation. Um, um, that entire collection lives in that, um, in this basically cop, cop, this form, which is, you know, a copy, old school copier um, um, that's in the hands of one of, one of the curators here on the, um, left hand side. Um, on the right hand side, what you're seeing are images of the the handicraft schools that Mussolini had um, um, in uh, in Libya. So he was actually having people make traditional crafts and building schools, making traditional crafts and selling them back to a to an Italian um, uh, market of for authentic, you know, authentic sort of exotic. Um, exotic things from, you know, Africa. Um, it's, it was a, dis it, what's interesting about this is that it's a very disturbing thing to see these heads. Some of them are death masks. Um, some of them are sculptures and just objects um, sort of in cellophane, excuse me. Um, so there's this really interesting way in which trying and trying to address it, they've made this extremely disturbing, uh, um, 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 exhibition. So this is Museo, uh, the Museo de la Civita and Ur, and within it, under this grand staircase, this exhibition found itself. You would miss it. You would miss it completely if you, uh, if nobody told you it was there. Um, and it was, it's a proposed as a Museo um, de Italo Africano, as you see here. Um, ongoing. Egypt is really important. Um, you see it everywhere. Um, I think one of the early rulers of Rome, Augustus, was obsessed with Egypt and brought in actual obelisks everywhere. So you see the one in front of St. Peter's Basilica. Um, the one in Florence over there on the left really is commemorating the patriots who served in the war in the in the wars in Eritrea and Ethiopia, for example. Um, and then at the for Italico, Mussolini's um, um, sort of signature is here uh, at the entrance of the foro, um, or, or you know at the at the, uh, the entrance of the grounds is also a kind of modern ge geode. Um, form of a obelisk. Some some of these things that I'm showing are just images that feel connected. I can't say, but these are ways in which the Fellini film at, 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 at Chinachita, uh, the old uh, film um, grounds is still there. And I believe this thing that you're seeing in the center but the a crown is uh, from a Fellini, a Fellini film, uh, and it goes on. Cults of Isis were popular during the Roman Empire. Obsessions with sculpt, even you know Renaissance obsessions with with Cleopatra, um, and that curious figure in 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 the um, in the churches in Rome that you would see in a lot of the Baroque churches in Rome. Um, is it a black figure? I don't know. Eyes eyes all seem to be point back to Egypt.
um, went the, went to Egypt um, and visited the pyramids of Giza. This is Shrada and I in front of the pyramids and my sister who joined us, my sisters joined us. I was really interested in how this, in the brick and how things are built and that kind of started coming into the work, like this kind of um, um, the way in which the different levels happened and um, you can kind of see the scale shift here of what those bricks look like. Um, um, I'll just skip this because I don't, um, this is just a little view of where we were. We had to, you kind of have to go get on the camel and go pretty far back to see, to have that view of everything. Um, looking at the Sphinx, if you go there, I mean, it's over a hundred degrees, right? So it's like insanely hot. Um, um, and I bought this wrap, which they they call Halloween. Uh, they said, you want to have Halloween, which is really funny because yeah, we are actually um, just dressing up. Um, and we went inside those things. This is a painting that kind of came out of that called Sphinx. Um, it's a very large painting at 94 inches tall um, by I believe something like 35 or 45 uh, wide. Um, and so you can see taking me taking in kind of some of that information of the building blocks. Um, went back to Sis went to Sicily. Um, that going back to that um, Testa de Moro wild story takes around takes place around the 10th century in Sicily. The Moors are in power, and um, a young prince falls in love with a Sicilian maiden. Uh, she finds out that he has wife and children at home and she cuts his head off and puts it on her balcony and plants basil basil in it. Uh, and the basil grows so beautifully that everyone wants a tested in more ahead of a moor uh, on their balcony. And so the story goes and the popular ceramic tradition in Sicily uh, happens. I got a cheap one um, from Porto Portese and started making my own interventions for the sculpture. Um, this is, we we uh, got with an, an, a, um, an archeologist friend and who was needed to be dropped off in a site in the center over at, by Inna in the center of Rome. So we flew in, we flew into uh, Catania uh, and um, we went to some places in the area like Termino and then we, Cruised down to Syracuse, came came around um, Modica, and over to Agrigento, and then into the center um, where uh, Kevin had his archaeological site. He was on his way to Morgantina, which is another archaeological site. So we learned a lot in that in that trip. The Calta Girone is the place of ceramics, and that big uh, staircase is all tiles. It's long, and it and it and ceramics are the thing there. Um, visited a Versaline uh, studios to learn more about Testa de Moro. Um, this is them sort of making them. Um, and what, what happens is that it's just this big sort of site. You see them at the top. If you start at the top left, he's showing us the, the actual slip. It's made in this machine and it's pumped down into the ground and it comes out into these hoses that are on the wall inside. And then they pump the slip inside the forms, and then you have, and they when they pull them off, you have this these this kind of clay form, and they set to dry, get white, and then they go into these big ovens. Um, I met, I was able to meet the artist, and she uh, and she showed me the drawings for this line that they were talking about, and she told, and I was asking her um, about like you know uh, the story and and uh, and and her relationship to black people. And she was like, well, I don't know. I don't know any black people. So this is all my fantasy about, about what, what black people would look like because of the story. Um, and so what happens here is they, they make, they make these very special ones. So you saw the artisans working on them. Um, they make these like this that are very, very detailed and special and they sell them for like a lot of money these could be like 400 to, to 800 Euro um, but then they also sell the white, the white disc, disc fired ones to a larger market. So if you're a mom and pop shop, you can open up a tested more shop in the middle of the piazza and get some, get a kiln and some glaze and, and go for it and sell them to some tourists. 
Um, I think that that is it. Somehow, I think I finished that um, that lecture, um, and I'm going to stop for <laughs> any questions. That was amazing. <laughs> okay, uh, can you stay on a couple more minutes, just because it just turned one, and there are some questions in the chat, and so uh, I'm just wondering if you can stay on for a couple minutes. Yep, five five to ten, and pretty sure I can do. Okay. Uh, Don writes, when I was at the Academy in 1994, we had special access to the Vatican collections. Did you do any research there? If not, is that access no longer there? Or did you just choose not to research? At the Vatican? I was able to get to the Vatican. Um, the Vatican has some some incredible, I mean, just incredible maps. And they have um, some of those uh, those Janny form pots or at the Vatican. Um I didn't do uh, I didn't do that that deep re deeper research there, but I was able to do some of the the incredible things through the academy, like go down into the into the bowels of the Vatican and and look at where supposedly Peter was buried and things like this. Um, um, but in terms of research on black cult black culture and civilization, just the things that were kind of readily available and on view. That's great. Does anybody else have any questions for William? Um, uh, we have a, a minute or two. You can put it in the chat or unmute yourself. Um, in the meantime, I just want to let people know that, um, uh, will, do you want to talk about your exhibition that's coming to PAFA in um 2025 i can so the, uh i'm having a traveling exhibition solo exhibition called myths and migration right now it is uh, in grinnell um art museum in iowa and it's going to travel to 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 madison museum of contemporary art uc boulder and find its way eventually in 2025 at pafa um and excited to work with uh with this group of wonderful people and making it happen. And some yeah. of this work that you've seen will be in the exhibition. We're very excited about that. Um, well, I wanna thank everyone for um, attending. Thank you so much, William. This was great. I I, uh, I just love the journey and the connections made and, um, uh, and it was uh, really great to see the slides and everything and all of your discoveries that you made. Um, and thank you all for coming. Um, and I hope to see you back at the next Art at Noon on April 24th. Um, yeah, that's all we have. Thank you so much. <laughs>